Okay, welcome back to another lec lecture wrap-up uh, video on today, lecture number 14. All right, and this is in Engineering 17, Section 2 here at UC Davis, uh, Spring Quarter 2014. All right, so today we talked a little bit more about some sinusoidal steady-state analysis techniques that we'll be using and looking at uh, RLC circuits using these now alternating sinusoidal sources, okay? So the first thing we talked about was the phaser notation. So phasers are going to be a way for uh, that will help us simplify some of the analysis by transferring from the time domain to the frequency domain. So this all, um, the phaser notation kind of comes from the uh, so-called Euler's identity, uh, which relates the, com the exponential term to a cosine uh, the real cosine term and an imaginary sine term. And so w I won't go through the full details that we did in the lecture, but uh, that is all in your book once again. But again, starting from the, uh, the sinusoidal form in the time domain, uh, which has the cosine function. So again, the maximum amplitude, the mega t plus the phi, the phase angle. We showed how we were able to transform that through this phase or transform into this notation where the phaser V, the voltage is the max, still the max voltage, but time is the, this exponential term to the J uh, phi. So phi here we have the phase angle. So another way to write that is to s sort of have this script phi, which is just saying the, the phaser transform of the, this uh, time domain version gets us into this frequency domain, and that's what I noted here. So this is very important to notice or note that these change the domain in which you're working in. So once you, once you decide to either operate u using this form of the function, we can do that, but we need to be consistent and continue to do that for, for all other functions that we have that they all need to be in the time domain. But if we go into moving and using phasers uh, through the phaser transform, this takes us to the frequency domain and therefore everything else we need, we're working with in a given problem has to be in that same domain. Can't mix those two up or else you are totally in a mess. Okay, so this will be, a I know this is a little bit of a kind of obscure um, topic for, for those of you that have never even seen something like this before, but as you'll see as we work through more problems, uh, there's a very significant advantage towards using phasers and some analysis techniques with alternating or sinusoidal based sources that'll be very convenient. So one thing to note though is that the phaser itself it does not have any information about the frequency, right? We only have the amplitude information and we have the phase information, but the frequency information is not there. So if we were doing an inverse transform to go from the phaser notation back into the standard notation, which is in the time domain, we would need to be given some information about the frequency separately because the phaser itself does not tell us that. Okay, now looking in, we, from there we went moved into passive elements and, and how we sort of analyze uh, the response from each given passive element when we're dealing with sinusoidal sources. So it worked out and uh, it all kind of boiled down to the fact that in, in all cases there's one general response that re still relates the voltage and the current uh, to each other through a new term that we've defined called impedance, this Z term here. And in this case the V and the I are both phasers, all right. Now this Z then is operating on the phaser current to give us the voltage, and so that impedance is then dictated by which specific circuit element you're talking about. So the impedance of a resistor is simply is resistance R. The impedance of an inductor is, as we worked through in class, J omega L, and the impedance of a capacitor is J times negative one over omega C. So therefore, if we're given any given element in, the, in a circuit, capacitor, inductor, or resistor, as we've, as we've been look, working with before, now that we're working in the more frequency domain, we can define its given impedance, and then we can add up these, add up these impedances or simplify these impedances down to a single equivalent impedance, and therefore that would give us the total relationship relating the voltage and the uh, current. Now a couple of other terms to know, we had talked about admittance. Admittance is simply the inverse of the uh, impedance. And admittance can also be written in the form of G plus JB, where G in this case is defined as the conductance, 
and that imaginary component B is the susceptance, okay? Just some terms to note so you understand what they are. We'll be using those more later. Okay, from there we looked into uh, how these again relate to some of the standard techniques that we've already looked at for uh, circuits that used, to, used constant steady state sources. And we found that actually, when we're, again, when we're using these phasor notations, the response is actually very much similar. So I just, uh, to point out when I write phasors, I try to do them a little bit as a boldface character, so I'm beefing the, these up here. But if we're doing KVL type of equations, uh, we would still do the same thing if we were writing an, equa an equation around a given loop. The phasor uh, equivalent voltages still sum up and add have to be equivalent to zero, okay? So there's nothing really new there. Similar for you, we're doing a KCL, look, so we're looking at a single node in the circuit. All of the currents coming into that node, again, still have to be equal to zero. So that hasn't really changed and still works in this new domain that we're working with then. Now looking at, uh, again, we talked about these impedance terms. And so if you have multiple elements, you need to combine and reduce these down again to some equivalent impedance now. And we work, worked out to find that if we have impedances in series, the equivalent impedance is simply the sum of those individual impedances. And if you have impedances in parallel, uh, it follows the similar relationship as we saw for resistors in parallel, where it's one over the equivalent impedance is equal to the sum of one over each of the individual impedances that are in parallel. All right, so this gives us some of the initial tools that will be important as you look at uh, specifically solving circuits with uh, resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and how we can get through from there. All right, so that about wraps up what we did today. We'll be looking at a little bit more of the sinusoidal analysis techniques in uh, uh, the next lecture, but this at least gives us a good start into doing that. And I'll look forward to seeing you all next time. As always, stay classy.